You want me to put that on my todger? This one's wife. I regret Prince Harry. Oh, Blue Eyes once sang, Regrets. I've had a few, but then again too few to mention. I did what I had to do. I saw it through without exemption. I planned each charted course, each careful step along the byway. And more, much, much more, I did it. I did it my way. Frank Sinatra sang of regrets. Many people have a regret as a consequence of an interaction with the gruesome twosome. I should imagine that the late Queen regretted the fact that this one's wife ever was allowed into the royal family. I should imagine Prince William regrets the fact that his brother has fallen under the spell of a narcissist. I should imagine various staff members who find themselves on the receiving end of her unpleasant temper regretted having an involvement with them. Although he was polite, I should imagine the chief executive of Spotify regretted spunking millions of dollars on the dross that was created by this one's wife. There will be plenty of people, commonly known as having been markled, who will regret their involvement with this one's wife and Harry. And the list of those expressing such regret has got a new member. According to the Daily Express and Emily Ferguson, Prince Harry's co-host regrets agreeing to interview him in Bonjour, new podcast. You may remember earlier this year that Prince Harry sat down for an in-depth interview with trauma specialist Gabor Mate. But now the expert says he regrets agreeing to the chat. We all know that Harry has been encouraged by his handler, this one's wife, to ensure that he talks about his mental health, that he talks about the various challenges that he's experienced as part of merching his misery, but also enabling her to then use that for the purpose of controlling him. By causing him to express his innermost thoughts about the topic, she has utilised his vulnerabilities initially during the Golden Period to give the impression of supporting him. And then in devaluation, she'll throw it back in his face, mocking him for his failures, taunting him in relation to his vulnerabilities. She does this because she uses everything about individuals that she interfaces with because she has no emotional empathy. She pushed Harry to engage in such self-flagellation as this conversation that took place with Gabar Mate. And Prince Harry's interview with him came back into the spotlight as the expert has spoken of his regret for agreeing to host the in-depth chat. Marte has said the interview has had a profound negative effect on him and has lashed out at two aspects of his chat that explored what the Duke of Sussex had revealed in his tell-all memoir, Spare. The interview, which took place on March the 4th and required online guests to pay £20 to tune in, saw Harry make a whole host of fresh allegations against the royal family egged on, of course, by his handler, such as accusing King Charles of traumatising him as a child by refusing to give him hugs. Now, he's properly accurate in relation to what he states there, because a narcissist such as King Charles is likely to have refrained from giving him hugs because of the intimacy that's associated with that and how the narcissist rejects such intimacy. The trauma expert claims he lost himself and neglected to follow his gut over the interview with Harry, which was organised by their joint publisher Penguin Roundhouse and streamed globally to a paying audience. Chatting on a new episode of the Diary of a CEO podcast, Marte said he felt profoundly uncomfortable that the discussion was put behind a paywall. He said, I had a good feeling all along that I shouldn't agree to doing it the way they set it up. 
The way it was set up was, in order to watch it, people had to buy a copy of Harry's book. And I thought, this isn't fair. Four million people have already bought the book. Why can't they watch this interview? Do they have to buy another copy? In other words, I believe that this should be a free public service on a part of two people who can have a very interesting conversation. But out of sheer opportunism, I agreed to it. So I didn't follow my good feelings. I lost myself even in agreeing to the format. The expert said that both he and Harry pushed for the recording of the event to be released to the general public, but they were told it would have breached the rules as it was publicised as a one-time interview. Marte added that while he disagreed with the format of the interview, he had no objections to sitting down with Harry. His second criticism of the televised discussion was the demeaning and dismissive reaction online, which included labelling him a stern, overbearing merchant of pain. He said the negative portrayals really affected him. The pair's chat took place two months after Harry's memoir was released and helped to further drive publicity for the best-selling book. Those who paid the fee to watch the interview also received a free copy in the post. Before it aired, much criticism was made for putting the chat behind a paywall, especially as Harry had given several public interviews in the months that followed the publication of Spare. Exactly below the line states the guy got harkled. India Flynn states, considering the guy is trained as a GP with precisely zero academic qualification towards his grift in mental health, I thought they were very suited to one another. Marie, 1956. Well, isn't that hilarious? They go and speak about mental health and cause an anguish, and cause anguish and sorrow wherever they go. Jane, five nine. Having a deep love for books, I like to see what's about and buy it, but never had the inkling to buy this, especially after much was revealed before the book was released. But I decided to follow with this book's sales and see what would happen, considering the book's content had been released on the internet. This is what happened at my W.H. Smith and Waterstones bookshops. They had masses of online payment for the book and both expected a long queue at midnight on the day of sale. There were no queues, no scrapping to get it, and one shop closed at 2am after maybe six people came to collect their copy. The other closed at 3.15 after 11 people collected their copy. Both stores had pallet full of sold books and had decorated the shop front with copies of it. However, many people said there was no point in buying it after all the stuff Harry said had happened and felt there was no point in wasting their money and deciding not to pick it up. Most were able to have their money refunded, others just didn't bother to, at all to pick it up. This resulted in some shops, over half, with people not bothering to collect them and it remained on store shelves or pallets. In fact, one actually emptied their shelves after patiently waiting for three weeks for people to pick their books up. They weren't allowed to put it up for sale until there was no response. Within three months, they sent between them two pallets of books back to the agency that supplied them in the first place. Kerrick states, It's not be careful of what you wish for, it's be careful of what you say. I couldn't listen to his voice, Harry's, for four minutes, but I could listen to William all day, and of course, Louis. Debbie Fry, I believe it's called the Grifters story. Banjo 2-2, two -two, it's what grifters do, even the sales of his book are really a lie then. All's Craig, it was a very poor interview. He believed Harry's childish attitude regarding his older brother hit more good and bigger room. All families feed their families the child needs. Older children do eat more than younger ones. Harry has a huge problem of coveting his brother's birthright. That never turns out well. The usual unfavourable comments about Harry pushed, of course, to do this, and it backfired. And now another person that was involved with the gruesome twosome has come to regret it. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.